So I'm looking forward to hear the point of views of experienced and famous providers of academic and practical education, as well, of course, from a major voice in European tourism, how they see uh, the possibilities and the activities necessary to change the mind and the hearts of the current and the future tourism practitioners. And uh, with this, uh, let us come back to the discussion. And uh, Eduardo, I can talk, start with you. Uh, as uh, obviously European Travel Commission, and maybe you can, I think most of you know Eduardo, but uh, we can brief, have a brief introduction and explain to us from an ETC point of view, how is your engagement, I know you do a lot of things, uh, also in, in this question of how to uh, prepare the next generation for these changes we will look forward to and we will encounter when, hopefully, the pandemic will be a, a nightmare we remember, uh, something which happened in the past. Thank you, Wolfgang. Um, yes, uh, good morning, everybody. Um, I hope it's still morning. Yeah, almost there. So, profoundly changes are coming to us, and we know that. Um, we very much talk about uh, resilience of the sector. Um, what I always say is, and quoting the, the author of The Little Prince, Antoine de Champery, is that our role is not to forecast the future, but to shape it. You know, we cannot know what is going to happen in 10 years. You know, a decade is a lot of time. What we can do is start changing things that we can change. And this starts uh, with measuring things that we haven't measured before. I think we cannot change what we cannot measure. And you mentioned in your presentation that uh, what we talk about, or we may, uh, actually name the new paradigm of tourism. We don't have a new paradigm of tourism yet. So we are creating it now. Um, it's part, obviously, of the Commission's plan now with the Green Deal and um, Fit for 55. There's a lot of intentions there, but there have to be a lot of facts and figures still put into uh, the gentleman from Qatar also was mentioning that uh, the ultimate goal of, of a business is also to make money. You know, we, we have to also, nobody goes on business, you know, to lose it. Uh, some, of, some of them do it. For me, the biggest issues that we can tackle nowadays at the European level are three major ones. First, connectivity. It, it has been heavily discussed. Everything that affects and touches connectivity affects massively tourism. I'm... It's affecting myself, you know, I cannot move as I would like to uh, for business purposes or for even for private purposes. And that has changed also my way of uh, seeing life and, and, and free time. Second, and you mentioned seasonality. Seasonality has to do a lot of with policy. And um, having the gentleman from the European Parliament back in the room, I think it's very important that, you know, policy is made by people you know, and societies are made by people. We have in Europe the big problem of... Uh, having 86 of all our destinations being affected directly by seasonality. That means that we are doing something very wrong. We go all the time at the same time to the same places on holiday. And this can change. We know some models, like regional models in Germany, they have different holidays according, you know that, according to the Bundesländer or the regions. Um, that was done, by the way, back in the 60s, you know, to not congest uh, the autobahn and uh, the, the highways. But now, you know, we have to decongest also some places and even uh, airports or air routes. We have the issue also of uh, workforce. It's on your presentation. I think this is a huge and underestimated problem post-pandemic effect, which is uh, very few people would like to work for uh, tourism or, and travel industry now. Why is that? I mean, there is obviously a systemic problem within the European market, and, and, and we know, and beyond. It's not a, we are not an attractive enough uh, industry because of low payments, because of volatility of the job. You mentioned seasonality, obviously, is one of the reasons. And people have moved on. The pandemic was just a catalyst of that. But we have to take much into account this factor because people make also a service being high qualitative or not. And this is, has to do with education. And addressing that to you as an educator and a, a personality from the academia, as uh, Professor Buhal is too, you know, there has to be inherently change in the way we educate people to work for a travel and tourism industry. Then we have um, the asymmetric 
resilience, which, you know, in every kind of crisis, and it has mentioned before, you know, we have uh, winners and losers. We've seen a lot of destinations profiting a lot uh, from this um, pandemic too, you know. And why was that? Because their governance was very different to the others. We see that, for instance, Greece reacted very quick, you know, to, the, to reopen the market, you know, and, and to reopen their destinations uh, to, the, to the world, and that paid back. We had other destinations that didn't, and they, it's not paying back. So I have to also to praise the role of the European institutions, which you know normally they are very humble when they when it comes you know to um, to mention the things that they do very well. But the DCC has been something very unique in the world again, coming from Europe. Uh, the COVID pass or call it the certificate, whatever you you name them, something very unique that it's been replicated again all over the world, and even our model is. It's a benchmark for, for so many other destinations. Moreover, um, I see that the intentions from the European Union for the different institutions, starting with the Parliament, the Commission, to have a harmonized, coordinated approach to crisis has to be readdressed. Because we don't see a more united sector as during a crisis. You know, tourism has been mentioned, one of the 12 um, ecosystems that should create the new economy of the European, that should create the new society of the European Union. So why is that? Because only during the crisis we were realizing the importance for labor, or for our social environment, for our economic environment, and obviously for the environmental environment. And it has been mentioned that uh, we should not be considered tourism, travel and tourism the cause of the problem. So I think it was mentioned two or three percent of the CO2 emissions. But we may be the solution of the problem, too, or part of the solution. If I may. You know, we, we have to address our interdependency of other sectors, such as okay, transportation is clear, but you know, agro uh, uh, agricultural issues, you know, um, social issues are so much dependent, uh, um, or tourism depends so much on them. So you see that this kind of interconnectivity let me think that tourism is going to have a, such a huge role in the next decade within the, you know, the, the policy here at the European level. And it should have it. It's not that I'm saying that. You know, it's, it, it has been demonstrated. Um, and maybe just a last uh, thing before uh, moving maybe to, to the next speaker is the issue of gender equality. And you know, I cannot address that more. You know, there's a lot of men in black again in this room. Um, and think we should uh, really reconsider uh, the female role in travel and tourism. It represents uh, more than 80% of the labor force. And it should be very much representing, uh, represented in any kind of tourism forums and any kind of discussion, and especially building the new policy in the future. Yes, thank you very much for that. And thank you also for raising this, the, the, the last point, because when we talk about the glass ceiling, uh, which is, uh, uh, when I said, yeah, mostly that the, the top jobs are mostly given to white persons. Uh, actually, more precisely, it is white men. Mm -hmm. and, and there's another glass ceiling for, for women in our industry as well. And uh, yeah, so I think this is uh, clearly the, 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 the COVID-19 crisis has been helping more people to understand the importance uh, of, of tourism. But uh, there has been a lot of discussions in many countries that uh, we also found that the people working in healthcare and in pe pensioners' homes, that their job situation is so bad and their payment is so bad, and we have to do something to, uh, um, to, to better their uh, employment situation. I have not heard much of this kind of ideas for tourism, when actually it is true for tourism as well, that uh, unfortunately our industry is not the most sexy industry to start your uh, uh, Career. career as a as a professional, and so that is hopefully also something which will be uh, come to the forefront. That also uh, to give very good service, you need uh, good people. You need people who are dedicated to their job and and uh, like what they what they do. And part of this is that they are paid properly for for, for that. So with this, maybe uh, Demetrius, uh, let's go to Hong Kong, uh, and uh, so. You are, but you're, you're working normally in the UK and now you're in Hong Kong, but you're a Greek and you just heard the praise for Greece doing the right thing. Uh, so from the academic point of view, uh, how do you see, and I know Hong Kong Polytech is one of the uh, universities at the forefront of new ideas and change and certainly uh, very much aware of, of uh, intercultural differences. So what's, what's your point on 
how to get these changes also into the uh, education and into the minds of the next generation of uh, people working in our industry. Thank you, Wolfram, and uh, great to be with you and fantastic to see uh, Eduardo and Eduardo covered a lot of uh, the things I want to say. Uh, I'm currently away from Bournemouth University on sabbatical in Hong Kong Polytechnic University. So I'm having a global perspective, if you like, on what's happening with uh, tourism and how uh, COVID has affected people. And uh, some of you will know that has affected me more than others because I lost my sister on COVID. And I think it's really, really important to actually start thinking about the situation that we've seen around the world uh, with COVID. And I hear a lot of people um, uh, pushing towards restarting tourism, uh, but, but I think we need to be a little bit more careful. Um, and coming into Hong Kong from the UK, um, I had 21 days of quarantine, hard quarantine in a hotel room, and I had nine PCR tests in order to be released to the community. Uh, so this is the one extreme, if you like, um, the other extremes in different places. I think it's really critical uh, to understand, and we've just started to understand how important tourism is. Because up to now, tourism was something, an activity that was happening in the background, and quite a lot of people were actually quite annoyed about tourism. And you mentioned, Wolfram, uh, uh, about over-tourism. As you know, I don't believe in over-tourism. I believe in badly managed tourism. I believe that tourism needs much more attention and needs much better planning, development and support in order to bring benefits to communities. And what we've seen communities around the world, I was in the summertime, I was traveling in Greece because I wanted to support communities and uh, especially on the islands. Most of the islands were absolutely desperate. I was speaking to people and they were telling me the year before in 2020, they had an incredibly difficult year and they were amazed that they, they survived the winter time. And I think you, we hear stories from Bali, we hear stories from Thailand, from Africa, in a lot of places where uh, the animals do not have enough food to eat because if the tourists are not there, they are not supporting feeding the animals and the whole ecosystem is under, is, is, is under uh, difficulty. I think for the first time, we've got the level of government support on a global basis to understand how critical it is. And I think for the first time, we see uh, consumers and tourists understanding how important tourism is for their mental health and their ability to see friends and relatives and their ability to survive in the future. Now, up to now, I think we are very guilty in looking tourism backwards. We have not really uh, adopted the new practices. And we are still thinking about the tourism industry as a legacy industry, how it was happening 20 or 30 years ago. And I think um, there's several progressive operators uh, that they are moving things forward. And when we are talking about how education is going to bring us benefits. I think, first of all, we need to start thinking about how research is going to bring us benefits and how we understand things in that detail and that granularity that will enable us to understand how we can generate transformational experiences and value for everybody who is involved in the tourism ecosystem. And once we understand that, we need to look into how technology and smart systems will take us forward to the next stage. I think we should not be looking to what jobs we had 10, 20 years ago, but what jobs we will need to have in 20 years ahead and what skills we will need 20 years ahead. And we need to start looking to how can we prepare the industry for the next stage. Right now, there's a huge shortage of labor all over the world because a lot of people moved away from tourism and hospitality and they started doing, because they couldn't find, they couldn't survive, they couldn't find work. And they went into logistics, they went to a lot of other industries. I think we need to start looking to what value do we need in the future and then start thinking about what can we do 
to co-create this value with the young people. I'm very privileged to meet young people every day and see how passionate they are about this industry and how they would like to take things forward. But quite often they are very frustrated because they are not given the opportunities. I think it's critical that we understand that um, most of the jobs that people will do in 20 years time will be very different to the jobs that they were doing 20 years ago. And I think we are all problematic in the sense that we have got a lot of legacy thinking. In my area, which is technology and smartness, GDSs, global distribution systems, are still dominating the industry. Yeah. And we've got a real difficulty in adopting the new innovative approaches to move things forward. I think this is a forum like, uh, uh, like the Global Tourism Forum should concentrate on that bringing together the best brains in the industry and bring together the best expertise from research development to co-create the new realities that they're going to take us forward rather than look backward. And I don't want to hear people about uh, uh, talking about degrowth of tourism. I really want to talk about how we can make sure that the growth of tourism can be supportive of communities can be sustainable, can be offering benefits to everybody who is on this ecosystem. And I think this is the challenge that uh, we are having forward. And I think COVID gave us the opportunity to pause for a minute and create that knowledge and think about what we can do. I spent most of the 400 days of lockdown in England doing the Encyclopedia of Tourism Management and Marketing just to bring all this knowledge together. And we really need to engage with industry very closely yes. to and, and governments uh, in order to be able to take this knowledge into the field and make sure that we can develop it uh, for, for developing the benefits that tourism is bringing. Yes. Dimitra, thank you so much. I think uh, this is a, a confirmation why we are here in the room together. And uh, this is a, a confirmation the, uh, the fruitfulness of the initiative of uh, Ismail and of, of the European Parliament and of uh, World Tourism Forum Institute. And, and of course, uh, I'm, I'm proud to say that in your encyclopedia, uh, there's also a little article uh, of me about meaningful tourism in, in, in there. But so I think uh, somebody said that uh, we are trying to, uh, uh, in our industry, it's like we, we try to drive a car by looking only into the back mirror and only looking what is behind us and not looking what is ahead of us. And I th sometimes my impression is that this is actually true, and that uh, so uh, I, I did a couple of, of uh, projects with my students uh, in, in Germany, and uh, I can tell you where we have been asking a lot of people in the tourism industry, uh, and including uh, logistics, including events, and so on, and people were all underestimating the effect of digitalization. So uh, that was before COVID. People were still saying, oh, maybe in 30 years, uh, yeah, yeah, but uh, what, uh, robots uh, at the reception, ha, ha, ha. So, so they really didn't get it. So, uh, and with, with this, let's, let's go uh, to Dubai, certainly a place looking forward, not backward, uh, and, and Syrah. So you're doing a lot of practical work in, uh, not so much in, in academia, but in training, so really the people on, on the uh, front stage. So how do you see how the trainings uh, you're offering, and, and we are happy that we do this together with the Hart Business School Institute, uh, together with you, how are the, have these trainings changed in the last years and how do you foresee uh, they will have to change more to, to uh, react to these changes and challenges? Thank you, Professor. So since morning, we've been listening to eminent speakers and uh, it's clear that the three drivers for this industry, given post-COVID-19 situation and scenario, the empowered traveler, the industry itself, and last but not the least, the employees. And uh, uh, you know what I notice is there's a lot of discussions around strategy and you know, the technology aspects, the digitization, the traveler's mindset, and so on. Uh, I'm kind of a bit biased because our, our company basically focuses on people. 
and their skill sets, uh, skill sets, because everything to me is brick and mortar and everything stops or the buck stops at the feet of that ultimate individual who delivers that service or product to the ultimate customer or the traveler. Uh, now keeping, uh, you know, obviously the, the, the shifts have happened in the industry, you know, we need gold standards if we want to, you know, get back into the game uh, and get this industry off its uh, knees and feet. Uh, and the only way of achieving that, Professor, is through the people or the employees of various companies within the industry. Uh, Pre-COVID, uh, the industry, uh, you know, tourism industry were probably the largest, one of the largest employers in the world. And that has changed now. Uh, and now uh, when we talk to companies uh, in our region, especially, you know, Dubai is going through Dubai Expo 2020 also. And we, we're very much engaged with that uh, as well. Uh, and the biggest challenge just generally is finding the right talent. Uh, you know, people are just not available. Training them, but above all, you know, keeping them with you, st stopping all the poaching and, and so on. Uh, so now if you've got, if you're lucky to find the talent, then there are two things which will keep them with you. One is money. We know that in tourism industry, frontline jobs are low, probably not uh, the best choices and options, especially for uh, Gen Zs now. They're uh, looking for more creative way of earning money. They're not ready to work uh, if they don't get the flexi hours and, uh, you know, part-time jobs. Uh, you know, they, they want to work in one organization or industry and they also want to work in another interest, uh, industry. We need to entice the women to join this industry. So given all of these challenges, money is going to make a lot of factor uh, uh, difference. The second one is close to my heart, which is training. Uh, but here we need to turn everything upside down. Uh, we need to borrow the mindset of uh, uh, Gen, uh, Gen Z's. And, uh, uh, you know, because, uh, uh, you know, baby boomers like me or Gen X or even the millennials, you know, uh, 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 our thoughts and experiences are important, but they cannot be the drivers for the future. So, uh, uh, you know, I was listening to the eminent uh, professor from Hong Kong and, uh, you know, it's a young minds and they're frustrated because they're not getting more and more involved. So the training needs uh, and the kind of work that we, my company is doing with HAT Institute is not about lip service and it's not anymore focusing on yes sir, no sir, three bags full sir kind of training. It needs to be uh, about service, but more uh, injecting into the DNA of the organization what service means to the new empowered traveler. It's all about profiling the traveler deeply, really, really, truly understanding uh, uh, his sense of purpose or her sense of purpose and why what is it that they are seeking? Uh, it's a, the training needs to focus on gold standards of the organization or the industry. You know, uh, those ultimate standards. It's not just anymore saying this is how we move from point A to B to C. It's really to getting into the how and why do we move from point A to B to C. So, in going back to the point about. Get, you know, getting it into the DNA of the people or why they're doing, you know, why they're servicing, why they have to smile, why they have to uh, attend to that customer and, uh, and so on. Skills in the past were more focused on, you know, problem solving, customer service uh, 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 and, and so on. More and more what the employees in hospitality or travel agencies or other tourism sections, they, the training that they'll need is more, uh, it needs to be more about self-leadership because we'll want them to 
be self accountable be able to make decisions and choices doesn't matter whether they you know junior most employees or senior most employees so leadership cannot be a department or a right of just one person it's got to cut across emotional intelligence very important and cultural understanding from a different perspective uh, uh, in the new normal because what is safe considered safe in one culture may not be considered safe in another culture so uh, so everything's turning upside down uh, and uh, i believe that uh, development and training is going to be the glue which is going to bring keep it all together thank you okay thank you very much saira i think this is a uh... Uh, some very uh, good insights from the practical side of, of all the trainings you're doing and, and we are uh, offering at the Hutt Business School Institute. And uh, it, so it's no less than what you're saying, turning things upside down. So it's not a little change we have to do, it's a big change we have to do. And, and uh, also, as you, you mentioned, uh, Demetrius, so of course, uh, there are a lot of good uh, ideas and, 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 and new concepts, and uh, it will be uh, our job, and that includes uh, the politicians, that includes uh, the uh, industry organizations, uh, to let these ideas come to the front and let uh, avoid that we basically say, okay, this was just a, a dent in the quantitative growth and... and uh, we are all getting drunk on higher arrival numbers uh, instead of uh, moving forward to say we offer quality uh, and quality which means different things for different people and earn the money from, from that. So with that, I'm afraid we, we are out of time. Uh, thank you, uh, our colleagues in uh, Dubai and uh, Hong Kong, Sarah and Dimitrios, and of course, thank you, Eduardo for being here and uh, thank all of you and I hope that it was uh, giving you uh, some fresh ideas. Thank you very much.